I am, I just cannot tell you how delighted I am that I Sister Joseph Andrew, Sister Marie Avila, for the Dominican Sisters of Mary, Mother of the Eucharist, are with us for this next hour. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us, Rhonda. Super, super, super. Well, we begin with a prayer, Rhonda. I know you've been praying all day long, but this is just so good. I don't know if you can see her behind us because the light's not real good, but Our Lady Guadalupe is who is in charge of every one of our vocations. So happy feast day to every one of us. I know, and I just love it. So, and thank you, Rhonda and Don, for choosing this particular day. And yeah, it should be a solemnity, we think. But at any rate, so, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. We always say Mary, Mother of the Eucharist around right here. And St. Juan Diego, Our Lady Guadalupe, Pray for us. all our saints and angels, and St. Joseph in his special year. Bring us. it on, Joseph. Okay, we need you. Um, come Holy Spirit, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so I have five minutes, and I can talk as fast as your ears can pick up, okay? So here we go. So in 1997, four of us sisters from another Dominican community, so we know what it means to be Dominican through and through and through. It's all we've ever been, actually. Anyway, began a new community in New York under John Cardinal O'Connor, who also should be canonized in, in our thinking. But in any case, um, and signed and sealed less than nine months later as a new community in the heart of the Mother Church, um, by St. John Paul the Great. Now, how do you like that? Notice Saint, 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 Saint. Yeah, okay. So you stick around saints and you'll become one too. At least that's our hope. Oh. Yes. Okay, so, um, yeah. So being Dominican sisters um, took a lot of prayer and I could go through that forever, but it doesn't really matter. God wanted it and it became, and John Paul II signed us off and founded us really. And then the four of us moved to Michigan, of all places, where we really didn't know anybody and didn't know what we were up to. And New York kept saying, oh, it's going to be cold. And we said, well, we made it through New York, because as you can tell by the Southern accent, we're Southern. And they go, oh, but you don't know what Michigan is like. So Don can verify this, too. It's really cold in Michigan, colder than it is in New York. All the uh, Great Lakes are like God's refrigerators and he's got all the doors open and it just blows across everybody. But in that case, you just have to have a warmer heart, you see. So when we began our community and immediately vocations started coming from everywhere. And so my summation of everything that's going on with religious life, which is a lot in the church today. So you girls need to thank God because he has you born at a specific time for specific reasons. Well, we all need to thank God that we're born now. And yes, the challenges are out there and we gotta be ready to fight like never before, but we have to be able to pray like never before and to love like never before and to work on the virtues that we don't have like mine. I don't have any patience whatsoever. So I have to work on it constantly, but God does things through that. So I'm kind of basically going around to Self-knowledge is very important. So I don't know if y'all are taking notes, notes of what you're doing, but self-knowledge, pray for that, read about that, try to figure out who am I as God made me to be. Okay, so the vocations started coming and they've come ever since in abundance. So today we are uh, over 150, I don't know the exact number, over 150 sisters and um, the Dominicans were founded over 800 years ago by St. Dominic. Um, he wanted us to be called Daughters of Mary and his uh, friars to be called Sons of Mary, but the church changed it to Dominicans, just like they did Franciscans and Carmelites and Augustinians and all that stuff. So anyway, we're Dominicans. And that's a long heritage of a lot of saints. So that's 800 years of Thomas Aquinas and Catherine of Siena and Rose of Lima and Per Giorgio Frassati and even Fulton Sheen was the third order and on and on and on and on and on. So a lot of saints. Are y'all listening as fast as I'm talking? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, that means I'm not gonna slow down. Okay, so all this to give us the impetus for what John Paul II, the great saint called the third millennial, the new evangelization. What does that mean? We're experiencing it in America now. We have taken for granted for so long the fact that we're a Christian nation. Now it's beginning to kind of wonder, are we really as Christian as we thought that we were? And if we are, you better step up to the plate. And as has always happened through church history, at a certain point in time, that could very well mean martyrdom. Well, then bring it on, you know, just whatever is the divine plan. And I say that 
meaning whatever is your vocation, you need to know it and to do it. So we thank you all for being here today because um, you're given of your time to do what is so essential to discern, God, why did you create me? Do you know how many girls out there should be discerning and yet how few really are? So thank God for the graces he's given you and keep moving. Just Kateri, hi. Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. I just saw your face. So keep moving and keep doing what you're supposed to be doing and know that God is with you. And really thank Rhonda and Don and um, for providing this for you because this is a very special gift. You're smart enough to take part in it. So thank God for your own um, graces that you're using, but thank them too. So anyway, the community is big now. We have settled in Ann Arbor, which is where we have our mother house. You will have a tour of it soon. Now -ish. Okay, pretty much like now-ish. <laughs> so I will be quiet-ish. Uh, not interiorly, but trying to be exteriorly so that you all can see our tour. Do we just kind of go yep. into our tour? A oh, good deal. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. So we want it. What we really want is. Oh, wait, since we, Evelyn did this. So yes. you will see her in these. So we really want you to come visit us. And that pains our hearts immensely that we don't get to see you in person. But hopefully, what we've put together kind of gives you an idea of our life, an overview, and it's to see our beautiful mother house. So enjoy. Enjoy. <laughs> Can you see that? How about now? You see this? Our lady, our lady or the mother house? Oh good. Rhonda's saying All yes. Right. Everybody's got it. See the sound? Great. And today we're going to take you on a tour of our mother house. Now we live a monastic life and that means that some of the areas of our house are cloistered. Those are spaces reserved solely for the sisters personal time for prayer and community life. So you won't see those places until you enter. But there's lots of places that we can show you. So let's get started. Come on. The sisters gather each day in the day profundus hall before dinner. Here we pray for the holy souls in purgatory. This is part of our rich Dominican tradition of praying for the souls in purgatory. This hallway is a place of silence. That means that no matter what conversation you're having, when you come to this hall, you stop speaking and pray for the holy souls as you walk through. Now we'll see how well you can keep silence. Follow us. Here we come to our education library. We have two libraries, but our main library is cloistered, so you won't be able to see that today. You know what I always say? Why have one library when you could have two? As Dominicans, a pillar of our life is study. So taking you to our library is a very important part of our tour. Over here, we have our children's section of the library. A lot of us are elementary teachers, so children's literature is a very important part of our apostolate. And as you can see, we have a lot of books. On the other side of our library, we have our general study section, the secular sciences like history, science, and world languages. We also have our collection of textbooks. If a woman doesn't have a teaching degree when she enters our community, after her initial time of formation, she'll return to school to get her degree. College, as we all know, is very expensive and we have a vow of poverty. So we share our educational resources and textbooks with one another. So this is the place you go when you get your syllabus at the beginning of a new semester. This is also one of our favorite parts of the education library. We have Yo-Yo Ma. Not my favorite of the Ma's. 
But who is your favorite? Ma's. Ma, Mary. <laughs> that was so bad. That was actually really bad. And if you need a good pick me up, we always have Princess Diaries 1 and <gasps> Princess Diaries 2 <laughs> and Saint Movies. The refectory is the monastic term for dining area. A pillar of our life is community, so we do all things in common, including meals. In the refectory, we sit and are served youngest to oldest. This comes from the time of St. Dominic himself, when angels appeared and served the friars bread from heaven, beginning with the youngest and ending with St. Dominic. The refectory, like the De Profundis Hall, is a place of silence. While we eat, we nourish our bodies and our souls. Each meal is begun with a passage from scripture and a spiritual reading book. On special occasions, like a sister's feast day or a holiday, we're dispensed from silence and we recreate with one another at table. Now let's head to the kitchen. So this, this is where we do our dishes, which Sometimes, like around Christmas and Thanksgiving, when all 150 of us are home, it's actually mountainous. Like you wonder, that perhaps billy goats live upon that rock. <laughs> <laughs> a fun thing about the convent is we really don't buy anything that's not in bulk size. Pretty much everything is jumbo, including your dawn. You might think that would take us six years to go through. Not true. Not even six months. No, not even six days. Probably six days. No. Yeah. No? Yes? Yeah. Yes, probably six days. Oh. Dishes in the convent are always a group effort. Our wonderful novitia sisters take turns doing the dishes. Because so many sisters live at the mother house and half of us are students and teachers, we rely on our young sisters and appreciate all they do to keep our house running. shopping at the beginning of every week. Yes. One way the sisters contribute to our communal life is through cooking. If you're ever looking for a party, it's likely in the kitchen. Cooking for the 70 sisters who live here year-round is no small task, and learning how to cook is something every woman has to learn to do when she enters the convent. Because the professed sisters teach during the week, the novices cook on the weekdays. But the professed love giving the Novitiate Sisters the weekend off by cooking some of our favorite dishes, such as homemade pizza, Korean beef, and in the tradition of our four foundresses from Tennessee, good old Southern favorites like biscuits and gravy, grits, and Mississippi mud pie. The lighting, should we turn on the You need to stop talking or start talking after I'm done laughing because most of these songs I'm still laughing and you can talk. Are you good? Are you good? Are you good? Are you good? This is our skillet which can be used for many purposes, as all things in the convent. You can make grilled cheese, pancakes, soup, mashed potatoes, but I don't recommend that. <laughs>
but oh, okay. it's not working right now. But again, as Sister said at the very beginning, that's because you have to get here yourself. And we know you can't right now, which is why we're doing all this. But you get the general idea and you get the, the idea of joy and you get the idea in the communal life. And since we're monastic, so first of all, how much time do I have to talk? Uh, five more minutes. Okay, good. So we're monastic or we're, we're contemplative apostles as Dominicans. And that means our prayer life is essential. And you know, we're going to go into our prayer life in our chapel pretty soon so that y'all can see the chapel, which is the, the jewel of the entire community. The rest of it's where we live, but that's where we are, who we are best with our spouse, Christ. And so also um, because religious vocation is spousal and it's also maternal in the sense of we are spiritual moms for the world. And so therefore, um, that's where we take all our kids and, and pray and pray and pray over all the, um, the multitudes that we carry in our hearts that, um, that we are responsible before God because if they're his kids and we're married to Christ, then they're our kids too. You get the idea. Okay, so um, you'll see the chapel, which is, which is really the, the most beautiful. But I think one thing that you pick up and they put that on fast forward so that you could see more in the town that we had um, is the joy of the sisters, wherever you run into anybody, um, we're either organized in something that we're going to do or we're participating in something that we're going to do. So um, tonight we're going to have a great big Guadalupana blowout Huge. with um, homemade tamales Huge. and um, mariachi band, mariachi. Absolute mariachi band. I mean, on and on and on and on it goes. And so we really celebrate the feast days. And yet on a ferial day or certainly during Lent, we celebrate the silence. And so what I think is important in life, whatever your vocation is, is to keep everything balanced. And that's not easy to do in a world that's always looking to the peripheries. You know, if you're great in this or you're really terrible on that, people are going to pay you attention. But if you're just kind of normal, they don't think that that's as exciting. In reality, that's where God's looking to find you. You're supposed to be normal. Esme, look at your big grin, honey. Thank you, nice Esme. For, I know it is a sweet picture. Um, so remember when you're discerning your vocation, you have to say, where am I, where did, where was my heart made? How was my heart made by God to love him? And that really does tell you and married people know what that means. And they would say, I need this other person as women. We would need a man. Duh. A man would need a woman. Yeah. And there would need to be openness to life, et cetera. Um, and then a religious would say, I would need about 20 men and maybe that wouldn't even be enough. So therefore it must be God himself because he is the man in whom if I give myself to him, I can have everybody else too. And that fits my heart. Other than that, it wouldn't just be enough for me. So everybody kind of has to really, you have to go inside yourself, which is why I keep talking about um, self-knowledge is so essential. But again, on the tour of the mother house, you saw some of the parts that you could see if you came to visit and you will be seeing the chapel pretty soon. Um, and, but you wouldn't see the monastic side, which is the cloister because as, as, um, as the monastic part of our life, we have that cloister just for the sisters alone, which is beautiful. That's where, so St. Dominic would say, other than the chapel itself, the only other place that you would go just to find God himself alone is your what we call cell, which would be your room, but in the monastic terminology, it's called cell. And you might've picked up that sister referred to the dining room, I guess you would say, as the refectory. So the, the monastic terms are there because again, they are places also of prayer. She also referred to silence for most of the meals of the day, not um, this evening, not today. because we're celebrating Guadalupe. But um, many of the meals are in silence, but a sister reads. And so she, she explained that and showed you that book at that mm -hmm. point that we were reading. Now we're reading uh, St. Padre Pro, who Miguel we absolutely Pro. love, Miguel Pro. Oh, I said Padre Pro, didn't I? Anyway, Miguel Pro, what was Padre? Which is the book? We're reading mm -hmm. Padre Pro, which is a book about Miguel Pro. Miguel Pro. And then Father McGivney. And Father McGivney, which is, which is really, really good, since he just got canonized. And that we know y'all know all this stuff because you keep up with the church immediately and you're, you know what's going on in the, the big celebrations you're in on. Okay. Sister, would you give us a little bit about your vocation story? Sure. So um, again, I'm Sister Mary Avila. And if you were on right before we started, I'm from Fort Worth, Texas. So born and raised um, around good fresh beef and amazing 
Mexican food and just a beautiful just southern culture I think in a lot of ways which um, has a warmth and has an openness to hospitality and generosity which um, I think are real characteristics that are needed in all vocations but I was shown that in a very natural way in my home environment. Um, so I'm in the middle of three children and my parents are just really, they're wonderful. Um, they weren't really given the faith, I think in a lot of ways. Um, my father converted when he married my mom from, uh, he was Methodist before and then became Catholic. But my mom is pretty typical 1970s child from catechesis. Like she wasn't catechized really. She loves Our Lady and believes firmly in the Eucharist, but the real um, other doctrines of the church, she really didn't know. And she didn't know how to hand that on to her children, but really wanted us to have the Catholic, the Catholic faith. And so my parents sacrificed a lot to send me and my siblings to Catholic school. So I went to St. Elizabeth Ann Seton in Keller, Texas from kindergarten through eighth grade and then went to Catholic high school. Um, but it was really, at my elementary school where that seed was planted in my heart. I first, I was, my first memory of religious life, um, having a desire for it was in kindergarten. Um, so I was five years old and our parish priest, Father Dennis, who's very saintly, gave a homily about the priesthood. And I remember telling my mom, mom, that is so beautiful to be another Jesus. I'm gonna be a priest when I grow up. And my mom was like, Oh, okay. Um, and remember, like Mulan had just come out. So girl power was strong. Like I could do anything I wanted. So mom brought me to Father Dennis after mass and just said, honey, tell father what you told me. And Father Dennis, I remember it clear as the day. He said, well, you know, priests are God's knights, but you are made to be his princess. And it was, it was like, oh, okay. I, end of story. No more. You don't have to explain theology of the body to me. I was created for a very specific purpose. <laughs> um, and I know that my identity is going to be in my father, who's the king. And also Princess Diaries had just come out. So, you know, it was this theme of I have an incredible heritage waiting for me was always was always around. Um, but I didn't I looked for it in the wrong ways, especially when I went to high school. I was very normal. I was homecoming queen. I was student body president. I was in charge of all of the clubs you could possibly think of um, and was really looking for that affirmation. I was looking for that identity um, and really couldn't really couldn't believe that really it was in God, that my identity was going to be um, in being his beloved daughter. And one thing led to another and I ended up going to Catholic University of America in Washington, DC for college. And our sisters are really blessed with the opportunity to pursue their graduate studies and live in the dorms at Catholic. So I actually, in the dorm next to me were two of the sisters and the dorm up the hill were two sisters and so from our community. So I was able to get to know them and really fall in love with Dominican life. And that was when I really started cultivating a daily holy hour, um, going to daily mass. I've been doing that through high school, but college it was, I was finding my whole life was going, making chapel visit to chapel visit, going in between classes, going after work, going before out to eat with friends um, in the city. It was, okay, where am I gonna squeeze in a few minutes? Where am I gonna, where am I gonna find him um, and bring him with me to those things? And I wanted to enter after my freshman year of college actually, and Sister Joseph Andrew, when I contacted the community and asked to enter, she's very wise and knew that I wasn't quite ready to enter and said, you know, I think you should probably go back to Catholic for another year and come back next year and you can enter in August after we're dialoguing and working together for the next year. So I entered after my sophomore year of college and I was actually accepted to our community on Our Lady of Guadalupe 2015, ah, five year anniversary. anniversary. Thank you so much. Our sister <laughs> Josephine accepting me. Here we are. Yeah. Here we are. Yeah. <laughs> So um, God is so good. And really, I think the hardest thing about telling a vocation story is in reality, that's just how I got through the door. My story um, is constantly evolving. And 
right when you think you understand how God has used people in your life or different events, um, he shows you just another angle of how he and his providence and his love has um, been bringing you to himself. So that's actually perfect. You hear our bell right now. That's right. Our sisters are going to holy hour. Um, Eucharistic so, adoration. Yes. Yeah, so we have Eucharistic adoration every single day. We're so blessed that that is the heart of our community. And in the tour of the mother house video that screw tape um, cut off, you were going to learn a little bit more about a day in our life. Um, but the, what you need to know most is that that Eucharistic holy hour is the heart of our day. That holy sacrifice of the mass is what makes us Mary mother of the Eucharist um, is what brings us to him. And then a uh, motto of the Dominican order is to contemplate and to give to others the fruits of your contemplation. So we're filled and then are able out of that overflowing goodness of God, able to give to others in our apostolate of preaching the truth, which in our community is done primarily through teaching and education of everywhere from preschool, little, little ones to college seminarians. We have the whole gamut in our community mm -hmm. and even teaching our sisters. We have sisters who teach our sisters full time. So really that Eucharistic Holy Hour is, is the center. Uh -huh. Well said. So y'all heard that bell. That bell is important for any monastic community. And I just want to um, speak in favor of that bell because there's so many times you get so mad at it. You do. Oh, the bell. Because it's right when you're about to get something done and to um, clench this thought and get it out there, whatever. And then the bell rings. And we really are taught that that's like God's voice saying, you, you're supposed to just leave it and go and trust that he's going to complete it somehow or another, or you will be able to more quickly. But the beautiful thing is, um, if anybody does go through our day, and they're constantly like, how, did you get, how do you get so much done in one day? And I always say, because we have a monastic bell, when it rings, you move. Because I might put in some more time just dilly-dallying on something that interests me. And yet the bell rings and I'm going and I'm before Christ in, in the Eucharist. And then I come back and I'm refocused on what the work before me was. So again, as Sister mentioned, um, the Dominican charism, the, the motto is veritas, which is the Latin for truth. And so we have a very active life of the mind. And I think that's very important. I always say if a girl wants to enter us, she has to have an intellectual curiosity now, did I realize that when I entered? No, and nobody ever said that to me, but I can tell you I've always been curious. And so I guess in a way I've always had that, but it's always to find out the kernel, the essence of truth as God made it, objective truth, and then to give it to others so that they then have that interior freedom to know the truth and to act out of the truth versus a ton of emotions and subjectivity and blah, 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 that just kills us all. So it's to really be able to think, it's to find the truth and to move with the truth. And then of course, with the truth is always gonna be charity. But Dominic was brilliant because he founded the order in a day of tons of heresies. And he knew that people weren't choosing to be bad, but they were ignorant. They didn't know the truth because the truth will always set you free. That's, that's out of scripture. And so again, as Dominicans, we always go at things with an intellectual curiosity that keeps life very fresh and very um, exciting and on and on and on. Now, at this point in time, the sisters are gathering in the chapel and according to your watch, mine's always a little bit ahead. Mine is right on the dot NASA time. So therefore, it looks like we have about one more minute for them to gather in there and we will go into Eucharistic adoration. And again, as Sister so beautifully said, there you can, don't turn on yet. Mm -hmm. There you can see the chapel. And what I hate about this is because of the way the, the cameras are set, you see the crucifix and, and Jesus, obviously, but you, Mary and Joseph's heads are cut off. So it's, just pray for us. I keep saying, move the camera up. But anyway, it is what it is. But Eucharistic adoration is why that in the in the devotion to Mary, which we take according to St. Louis de Montfort, who was a third order Dominican, by the way, any rate, is the reason that we chose our name as Dominican is obvious, it's who we are, Sisters of Mary, Sisters of Mary is what Dominic wanted to call, remember I told y'all that, Dominican Sisters of Mary, Mother of the Eucharist. And there's just not another title that comes anywhere new it. I near it. I know you agree. But I'm just saying, so if you all are ready, we will go into a little bit of Eucharistic adoration 
and you'll hear singing eventually, but we wanted to give you at least a little taste of our Eucharistic adoration.
Great. So one thing That's before we start to question and answer, if any of you are interested in watching the rest of the tour of the Mother House video, you can all put the, I'll type the link into the chat box and you can join us for our virtual discernment retreat. You can just make a free, um, free account and then just make, go through our virtual retreat and it'll tell you more about our life of prayer as well. But that's the heart of our life right there. Amen. Eucharistic Holy Hour. Got that right. Couldn't do it without that time with our spouse, day in and day out. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I think Dawn, are you ready to ask some questions? I am. I was just see, waiting to see if there was a last moment you guys were about ready to share. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, so. Baseball, softball. Um, <clears throat> there was a chat moment where somebody was asking about your habit. They were actually specifically asking about your metal. Oh, but oh. if you could, we haven't actually addressed that conversation with any of the sisters yet. So can you give us like an overall why habit and then yours specifically? Okay. So we wear the 800 year old Dominican habit. And so that's basically the, the scapular of the Dominicans. Y'all can see pictures. Anyway, we're going to, um, and then it really came out of the, the canons regular, which, which Dominic was a part of 800 year plus years ago now when he founded the community and he just kept the, the monastic habit. And it's unusual in the sense of it's white, but the canons regular, you know, we don't need all this history, but they always wore the white. Whereas most others, probably for practical reasons, although we have it all figured out how we can stay looking good, you know, but in the same time, probably for practical reasons, chose darker colors. But in any case, the Dominicans are, um, and the Norbertines, if you know the Norbertines, they also have the, um, the whiter color. But in any case, um, the scapular, which goes in the front and the back, just as if you wear your um, Franciscan scapular, your brown scapular. Anyway, so the scapular, which goes in the front and the back, and that's uh, like Juan Diego's tilma went in the front and the back. It's in a sense, it's kind of a type of scapular, speaking of the feast day today. Anyway, that was given to us by the Blessed Mother. So when Blessed Reginald, one of the early, early Dominicans was dying, she appeared to him and she gave that to him and said, this is a special mark of my community on the Dominican order. And so that's very, very special. And that's the only part other than the veil itself, the black veil, not the white veil. So I think you saw pictures, did they? I'm not sure. Anyway, postulates, novices and white veils. Um, if the picture had been taken in the back of the chapel, you would have been looking through to the Eucharist, there are a whole sea of veils, black veils, white veils, and then Pashlan. hair. Yeah, here. here. But in any case, um, so the scapula was given to the community, uh, the, the Dominican order by Dominic, and so it's blessed. Um, but then the other part of the, the habit, which we love, is our 15 decade rosaries, which we spread them out, we go to the wall, which you can't see over there anyway, but it's 15 decades. And then on this side are our five decade rosaries. So yes, we use them both. Oh. So again, the tradition in the, in the church is that when St. Dominic was trying to convert the Albigensian heretics and it wasn't really happening, he gave it about 10 years of his life to do this and not much was visible. And that's a good lesson to us. Don't always look for the visible results. Keep doing what you're supposed to do anyway. He went begging as a child to bl the Blessed Mother, um, it, teach me how to, to reach souls because I'm trying my best and it's not enough and you can do it for your son. And she appeared to him holding the Christ child and holding the, the rosary and handed him the rosary. And so, and she said, with this weapon, you will conquer. So we Dominicans call the rosary our weapon and we wear it on our left side because in the medieval ages, which Dominic was a part of, the weapon was worn on the left side. Because if you were um, right-handed, as most of us are, and your sword was in your right side, so before you got it out, you'd be killed, you see. So you had to get ready to whip it out. So this is our weapon against the, against the evil one. And so the rosary is very, very, very important to the Dominican order. Then the other thing that you were pointing out, Don, uh, when we became Dominican Sisters of Mary Mother, the Eucharist, uh, which is a specific group in the heart of the church, in the bigger umbrella of the Dominican order, then um, we got these medals. And these medals, um, gosh, can you lean in and everybody kind of see that sort of, you can see it all over the internet, et cetera. Anyway, so you see 
the Blessed Mother holding the Christ child, Mother of the Eucharist. And um, she's got the black and white of the Dominicans on. And behind her, if you don't mind leaning up one more time, if you look real carefully, you can see behind Jesus and Mary there is a chalice because he is the Eucharist and there's also the host. So that's neat. Okay, so she's mother of the Eucharist. Then you can see the eight-pointed Dominican star of St. Dominic. And there's reasons why that is. And again, we don't have time for all the details, but that star is always very Dominican. And then um, she's uh, the black on the sides. We wear the black capes um, at certain times of the year. The Dominican priests wear more than we do, but you will see that. And that's a sign of the penance over the joy, which is the white. And then um, at the very, very bottom is 1997, the year that we were founded. And so these medals are just specific to Dominican Sisters of Mary, Mother of the Eucharist. And you probably don't know Sister Mary Jean Dorsey, but she was a great Dominican and she became very well known because of her cuttings. And you maybe have seen some of those. Um, they're kind of all over the place in artwork. And so she taught this little fourth grade boy, Don Paulus, how to do these. And um, then, of course, he became a great artist as he grew up and maintained his friendship with her. And when she was dying, she gave this Mary Mother of the Eucharist. Now, that title wasn't really all that well known. It's become much more well known through us. John Paul II used it back in Poland, and it was used a couple times. And some of the saints have references to Mary Mother of the Eucharist, but it's not one that you hear a whole lot. But in any case, she had drawn this Mary Mother of the Eucharist, but she gave it to him and said, I will never be able to cut it out but I'm going to give it to you to keep, and you will know someday who it belongs to. This was years before we began our community. So he flew from Albuquerque, New Mexico, up to New York when he heard the name of the community, and he said, I have something from Sister Mary Jean Dorsey that belongs to you all. So he gave us this, and then we put it into the Dominican shield, which is the shape that it is for the Dominican shield. Nice. Thanks, Don. Thanks. One question and follow-up. Um, there's a lot of questions regarding your specific order of Dominicans compared to other orders. Um, is there something you want to tell us more about your specific focus? Someone asked about the new evangelization. Um, if you could elaborate. Yeah, thank you, Hein. Okay, so a doc just answered the question. So it was founded on the cusp of the new evangelization. So if you were alive back then, which many of you weren't, it was in a very incredible, exciting time. Uh, it was exciting the entire time John Paul II was Pope because he just kept moving the church and he had a vision and he had a purity of heart and he had a love that if you went to a World Youth Day and you saw him on the great big, what do you call those, jumbotrons, mm -hmm. you were sure that he looked at you. You just knew that he did. Anyway, many, many stories about, many things about the great St. John Paul the Great um, who kept the church moving um, with a spirit of intense joy and excitement. And um, you were just so grateful that you, by God's goodness, gave, he gave you the Catholic faith and, and you were able to live it. And, and he went about everything that he did with, with that kind of pristine joy because he had suffered so much in Poland under the communist regime, as well as under the Nazis, as well as on and on and on. So if you don't know his life, you need to know his life. Make sure you do know. Y'all writing that down if you don't have that written down. Know the life of St. John Paul the Great. You need to. He's part of us and part of who um, all of us, the, the entire church, when I say us, I mean all of us. In any case, what was your question? Oh, so we were founded under him. And again, his whole thrust was that countries, and now I would have had uh, the United States, which I didn't back then, countries of longstanding Christian tradition are losing it and taking it for granted. Do you ever realize you can take your Catholic faith for granted? And that's terrible, and we all do that. How many times do you just really kneel before the Blessed Sacrament and say, God, thank you for helping giving me the Catholic faith? I don't do that enough. Um, we take things for granted. And yet, if you have that love and that zeal, you want to get up and tell the whole world about it just in case they're called to and they needed you to say something. And that's how you influence each other by living your faith and loving your faith and having that joy. So with him saying that, he was really referring to countries of we need to go back and re-evangelize, re, um, I said, do we do that or is she doing okay. We need to go back and, and re-get people who have taken their great their faith for granted. Sorry, Rhonda, we just noticed. 
and, and get them back on track with an excitement and energy and an enthusiasm, which is what you young people are so good about doing and everybody should be. And so that's when we founded our community because he called for communities that were already established to in whatever way the Holy Spirit might be leading some to found a new community and to branch off and to recover the world again. And, um, and so, yeah, we were founded on that cusp of the new evangelization. So our spirit is very much pray hard and then get out there and start talking, get the world converted. That's your job. That, and that doesn't buy, it's not necessarily what you say, it's how you live. It's your joy, it's your enthusiasm, it's what you bring to, to life. Anyway, so all that to kind of say that was the thrust for our community. Um, and then, um, yes, there are other wonderful Dominican communities. And I used to try to give some examples of how we're different. And I would list the total consecration of Mary according to the list of Montfort and the daily Eucharistic adoration, et cetera. But I don't even do all that anymore. Whenever, if ever, you feel called to the Dominicans, you need to visit them and you should be able to tell the differences. Um, we are who, who you see. We, we don't hide anything. We are who, who we are. Um, so you should be able to see the differences. And again, um, if you're looking at, at good choices, and they're all good, I mean, in the eyes of the church, quite obviously, then you have to really pray and say, where's my heart more at home? And some people are like, well, I didn't get that feeling as soon as I walked in the door. Many people do, many don't. God treats you uniquely. Don't use as an excuse, somebody else had an experience I didn't. That's a bunch of baloney. You have experiences they don't. God loves you uniquely. Know that love and move on that love. And so um, I think, you know, if you go and visit other communities, you'll be able to see the differences in, in the spirit, even though they're all good Dominican communities or they're all good religious communities because I know you have a wide variety today that you're looking at and bravo because those are all good communities. So, um, but they all have their own spirit. And even if they're the same spirituality such as all Franciscan or all Dominican or whatever, they're different because each one is found at a different time in history for a slightly different purpose and they bring a different kind of energy to that. And so, um, how's That's that? Awesome. Sister Joseph, Andrew, you're one of the few that can use baloney so well. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to, um, uh, uh, we are going to see another poll, everybody, as you getting used to seeing our polls. Uh, this is poll number four for the Dominican Sisters of Mary Mother of the Eucharist. So discerners, you're answering number the one question. And those who are curious about convent life, answering the second question. Um, so I know that we've just so enjoyed learning so much more about the Dominicans. I mean, I think Sister Joseph Andrew and Sister Mary Avila have done a great job of giving us the um, that sense of what does it mean to be Dominican? And then as well, to be Dominican sisters of Mary, mother of Eucharist. Boy, and that, that um, few minutes of uh, Eucharistic adoration um, was so powerful. We had some chats going on and some women saying that they were already, they were to tears just Oh, yeah. so, so beautiful hearts. Yeah, very in, in, incredible. Um, so uh, I know that there was another question about um, ages that you accept and people with, uh, you know, if they have particular needs like allergies and dairy allergies, gluten allergies, that kind of thing. Oh, you want me to answer? Yes, please. Oh, okay. Ages. Okay. 18 up to say 32 ish there's a bit of ish on that side but 18 is is the youngest and um the average age of all the women who've entered our community basically always kind of boils down to 21. so um yes right out of high school as long as they're 18 um and then through college or in college and in the workforce sister was in college to kind of um, but after approximately at 32, the woman is just too set in her own ways to be able to all of a sudden kind of change everything and live a religious life, which is a very structured life. It's a very set life. You don't come in and say, I think we'd do better if we did the following. You come in to do what we do because it's our community and we know what we're doing. So 
that flexibility kind of has to dissipate as time goes on and we all settle into our own ways. So the prudence of that is, is very, very real. Although it can happen, but it's, it would be more unusual. And then you asked, no, oh, oh, health. So according to the church's canon law, you have to have the church will always say average health, but it also specifies health um, necessary for the, the life of the community. So you can't enter a community. I could not be a missionary of charity for a lot of reasons. And I think they're beautiful. And I've sent many, many girls to them, but it's not my vocation. And I couldn't even live their life for a lot of reasons, but they're beautiful and they're saintly and all the above, but that's not my vocation. So part of the way that you really know which community or even, even if you have a religious vocation is do you have the health necessary? So I can't get into the specifics because what I would normally do is if it's too out there for us, I immediately know this can't be the community and it, and you may or may not have a religious vocation because your health needs might prevent you from being able to live a common life, which we do. Um, but if it's more the gray type areas, then I'm like, I need notes from your doctor to find out exactly, because there's no point in entering any community and then realizing I can't do this. Um, there's a lot of emotion that's set up immediately. The sisters fall in love with each other immediately. We're a very strong family. And then all of a sudden somebody has to leave. That's always hard. And for me as vocation director, I'd say that was my problem because I didn't see that ahead of time if that was something that could have been seen ahead of time, not everything can. Um, so yeah, there's there's definitely parameters because you have to do the work um, also of the apostolate. When you consider we get up every day at five o'clock and we have a Eucharistic adoration every morning that really feeds our spiritual thrust of our um, apostolate out there. And we teach harder, we work harder, sister studying hard, getting her college degrees, et cetera. Um, it's, it's a full life. And if you don't really have very much energy, you can't do this. You'd peter out you'd go to bed crying and you'd have to go home. What would be the point of that? So you have to find a community that if you believe it's religious life that fits your health needs. And I can't really get into all the specifics because again, somebody could say I have an allergy and I could say, well, most people have an allergy. What is yours? And to what degree do you have it? And so that would have to be flushed out, but there are certainly some um, medical things that I would just say, you can, you can't teach, you know, it would be like somebody that, you know, weighed 120 pounds and was what everyone wanted to be the star of the, you know, college football team. It'd be, you know, think, just, get, just let's get this real. So we had a quite a few um, women want to know more about you, your uh, particular community. And so many, like 80 something percent said that this time with you has helped them understand religious life more. So that is God is good. Um, yes, God. God is good all Amen. the time. Thank you so much. <laughs> Everybody, please give um, Sister Joseph Andrew and Sister Ma Marie, uh, Mary Avila a big round of applause or big thumbs up and thank them for their time. We love you so much. And um, we look forward to um, many women finding out more about you as we go forward. God bless you God. all. Pray for us and we're praying for every single one of you. Whatever is God's will, find it and do it. it Become the same. And yes. we'll see you guys in an hour. Oh, that sounds good. The discerners, um, those of you who want to be back with the Dominicans, we have a, a, a couple rounds with them. So great. sounds great. God okay, bless you all. Well. Love you. Bye-bye. We're going to go to Eucharistic Adoration. Yay. Taking you with us. Okay. Thank Bye. you. All right. Okay. Um, so, Dawn, you are going to uh, lead the ladies in a little bit of time of reflection. Yeah. Let's just do very short so I can yep. give you a five-minute break. So, we'll just, we'll just do a, a, a very brief come Holy Spirit here and, and invite him in. So, okay. Oh, come Holy Spirit, we ask you to quickly enlighten us in any ways that you want us to remember this beautiful community of Dominicans. Anything that struck us, any emotion, anything in particular that these women want to look more into about this community or other communities. We ask you to we thank you for the time and adoration that we got to have and hear the beautiful voices of these sisters. 
And we thank you for their joy as they were roaming around their convent and showing us how large, how, um, yeah, just joy-filled these sisters are in Dominicans Mary Mother Eucharist. Just a couple seconds to write down anything you wish. Thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for what you're doing and what you're yet to do. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.